thanks to everyone for putting this together. Um, and apologies in advance for how ethereal some of this is going to be. It's a um, hazard of my training, I guess. Um, but I'm gonna do my best to say specific and concrete things that I think um, follow from the philosophy. Don't, don't stay with spiritual stay. <laughs> <laughs> Vote of confidence, hell yeah. <laughs> All right, um, so my argument won't be anything novel about what's cool about basic income, um, but if I'm lucky, I'll say something slightly different in terms of a unifying explanation of social things that happen, um, a lot of things that uh, leftists talk about um, from causes of patriarchal violence to um, the so-called cultural turn um, to um, more direct things, the material problems that basic income is supposed to solve. <coughs> then two, um, I'll have given an argument for basic income based on its political effects, not just its material effects. Um, even though I think material effects are the important ones. And then finally, I'll hopefully have talked about some new, new vocabulary that might help in messaging. Um, so the name of the talk is Basic Income Agenda Setting and Precarity. So I'm gonna talk about what agenda setting and precarity are. Um, so I think security is pretty simple, right? Um, if something's secure, it's reliable, you can count on it, you know it's going to be there tomorrow. Um, what I mostly want to say about this is to give a distinction. So there are two kinds of security um, that we've been talking about in the undercommons. Those two are... Um, objective and subjective security. Um, there's, a, there's a very jargony um, definition I could give, but mostly the important thing is that objective security is based on the facts on the ground, and subjective security is what we think about it, what our predictions are about our future, um, and it's important not to confuse those. But the more important distinction, I think, is between antagonistic security and collaborative security. Um, so I'm going to read a section of the article, um, No Racial Justice Without Basic Income, where we talk about this. Capitalism in the United States functions by creating, maintaining, and exploiting class and racial differences to produce antagonistic forms of security. Antagonistic security is security that is created for some people by processes that work against the ability of others to access resources such as wealth and political power. For those on its receiving end, it often generates precarity from barbed wire fences to predatory police patrols. In the right context, um, actually, that's enough. So, so the idea is um, precarity, precarity being the opposite of security, just because it's easier to think of it as its own kind of thing, as opposed to the term insecurity, where you think it's just a lack of security, and that's not necessarily what we think. Uh, and then finally, um, two terms from language. Um, so common ground, it's this term that this fancy guy at MIT came up with. Uh, it's a linguistic resource that we use in conversation. Um, so it's the background information, the things that uh, we both treat as mutual knowledge so that we can have conversation. Like the English language, meanings of words, those things. Um, and when we 
talk in conversation, we add things to that common ground. And what's in the common ground at any given time um, affects the public interpretations of new things that happen. And I'll give some examples. Um, but it's not just talking that um, is managed by the common ground. Uh, not just language, but also behavior. Um, so take the example that Ling Wei gave of offering money. The way that that behavior, that action was interpreted um, depended on what people thought about the situation, about the power dynamics, about the people making the offer, um, and how that offer was interpreted depended on that information. Um, so that's an important thing um, about the common ground that I'll use to explain this agenda setting thing. And so agenda setting is the term I use for describing the existing incentive structure for performing and interpreting action. So think of agenda setting um, and its effects on the common ground as the same kind of effects that asking a question has. So if I ask any of you, where's Third Street? Um, the rest of us in the room um, can expect, form some expectations about what the next thing, the next person's going to say is. It's probably gonna be some directions, right? We're gonna say something about where Third Street is. Um, or they're going to apologize for not knowing where 3rd Street is. Um, if I ask you, where's 3rd Street? And uh, you reply, I like turtles. Well, that's unexpected. Um, <laughs> we might think of you as a little bit of an asshole. Um, and and it's, not, it's not the thing our expectations um, are going to be calibrated to. Um, so my argument is that economic effects and economic situations are like that, are the same kind of thing. Um, so if full-time employment becomes scarce, for example, but we still need that to, say, support a family, that's in effect to ask the social question, how are we going to support families in this society? So we can interpret a lot of the trends that happen in society um, as attempts to answer that question or respond to the economic situation that is like asking that question. Okay, so The, the problems in society for the economy are pretty well known. Um, people describe the situation in a lot of ways, the uberization of work or the flexibilization of work, um, the, the trend towards part-time, shittily compensated jobs, right? Um, I like the term precarization because it uses the term precarity. Um, but let me know what the cool kids are saying, if it's something else, and whatever, <laughs> right? Um, so, so my claim is that economic systems that distribute precarity of this kind, um, that uberize work, that flexibilize work, those exert an agenda-setting effect, making financial security the kind of question structuring the conversation that where's Third Street? structures the conversation. Only, in this case, the conversation is what people are doing, how they're trying to survive, despite the fact that they don't know how many hours they're gonna get, um, they don't know if they're gonna have employment tomorrow, so on and so forth. And I also wanna mention at this point um, that the distribution of precarity is highly, highly racialized. Um, Furthermore, the undercommons uh, views that distribution as fairly foundational to racial capitalism. Um, so there's been persistent differences in unemployment rate, 
rates across racial distributions um, forever, ever. Um, Fehrenbacher in 2016 finds strong racialized effects of objective precarity on subjective precarity. Um, so the odds of perceiving job insecurity are 45% lower for non-Hispanic white people than for people of color. Um, if black America had its own common ground, the question, how are we gonna survive financially, would have been an agenda setting question, arguably since Reconstruction. Um, and I think it's important to note that because we often direct our political attention to the questions that come later. So it's often um, recounted that the CIA conspired to plant uh, cocaine in black communities, which is true. Um, but what isn't said um, is the structure of society that had to be in place for that to work. I suspect none of you given a kilo of cocaine <laughs> would, would, would feel the urge to sell the, that poison to your neighbors, um, to their children, um, because you know you all either are gainfully employed or just well-dressed <laughs> poor people. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, Okay, I'm gonna skip that. So if neoliberalism or whatever you wanna call trends in um, our economic system, uh, people argue about that term for days and I just, you know, whatever. Um, we, if it erases the possibility of genuine job security and financial security, then it can be analyzed as an agenda setting effect roughly as asking the question, how are you going to be financially secure? Making that an organizing question of society. Um, so two predictions on this basis. Um, one, we should expect to see the worst effects, um, the most maladaptive social behaviors where there are the least opportunities for compensatory strategies. Um, so for example, I'm from Ohio, um, maybe the meth, meth capital of the Western Hemisphere, um, unless someone's beating us out these days. Um, because, which, you know, reflects the economic opportunities that are available in between the major cities. Um, that's a hypothesis. So the second prediction is more specific to basic income. Um, and it's a more positive note. It's the prediction that maybe this is a ripe time for the basic income conversation. So in previous economic eras, the answer to how are we going to be financially secure uh, might have taken a different tone for much of the population, I would argue much of the politically influential population. Um, for that subset of people, the answer to that question is something like, get a 40 hour a week job, um, you know, get a union job back when there were good union jobs, right? Um, but for many people now, people have strategies to deal with their lack of an, an answer to this question. There's a hustle economy. Um, there's, you know, a lot of, there's a gig economy and freelancing, um, but there isn't an actual answer to the question. Um, and that might be basic incomes opportunity. Um, so finally, I can say some concrete things that I think might be true based on all of those guesses. So um, strategically, basic income should be compared to other ways that people are trying to create antagonistic security, not to other ways that people are trying to create collaborative security. So there's a reason why Trump's motto is America first. It betrays an understanding of the world that needs the rest of the world to be last um, in order for us to be secure. Um, Anti-immigration sentiment and workplace discrimination, you know, those sorts of things go hand in hand with that 
approach. So basic income components are not um, guarantee, job guarantees, it's not um, Medicare for all, um, and it's not just because the people that happen to like those things also like basic income. It's not a sociological fact. It's actually a fundamental philosophical fact about what those things mean. Um, specifically, the fact that those are ways of generating collaborative security. Basic income's political opponents are um, an unfair prison system and predatory policing, militarized borders, right to work legislation, and again, not because the people that support those things tend to disagree with basic income. I have no idea whether they do or not, though I would certainly guess that they do. Um, but because of this, this principle about security and about um, the philosophical relationship of basic income to security. Um, and so I think um, there's at least preliminary reason to prefer messaging that um, compares basic income to that second list of things rather than the first list. Um, and then finally, looking at basic income as a method of answering a question also shows us another thing about what good messaging or organizing strategy around basic income might be. Um, which is that it should embrace rather than reject the identity-based arguments. Um, so um, there's been, a, I felt a reluctance on some people's part to um, stray from the universal part of the universal basic income um, because people think that um, it will be divisive to point out um, how universal basic income um, interfaces with racial justice or gender justice. Um, but I think this is, um, I think one, that divisiveness is inevitable. Um, two, that um, focusing on specific identities helps ground the thing basic income is, which I've argued is an answer to a question. Um, it shows if you're this kind of person, this is how basic income answers the question for you, how you are going to be financially stable and otherwise materially stable. Um, and so from a messaging standpoint, I think, again, there's strategic reason to do that if, again, I'm right about all the proceeding. Thank you.